John. The long night is coming, and the dead come with it. He looks like Rob when I sparred. With him, with that long face showing behind those tully locks. Maybe Rakan, only if you can keep your shield up, or you'll get knocked on your ass. Rakan grinned briefly before returning to an angry scowl. His younger brother started their spar again going through his forms for battle with John teaching the lad. This had become a routine of theirs ever since Rickens returned to Winterfell, getting up at dawn to practice combat by themselves before they broke their fast and begin each day's work. It had served as both a way for John to spend time with his brother, and a good way to start giving Rickon more control of that savage nature he'd picked up from being a lone wolf. John could see that every time him and Rickon sparred, his younger brother fighting with a temper behind each blow. Today was no different, as John parried and blocked each of Rickon's strikes, each and every one hitting with a ferocity behind him. The ferocity was not something John would train out of the boy. It has served me well, and it will him. But what he was training out of him was the sloppiness that came with it. It was a gradual process, but he could see his brother thinking more. When he was of age, John had confidence that his brother would make a fine prince of winter. John grinned as his brother attempted to catch him off his guard, going for a lower blow with his sword. A good idea, but he lowered his shield. John quickly deflected it and brought his practice sword through the opening Rakan had made. John grinned at his brother with the sword before going to the weapons rack. Rickon followed. You have to keep your shield up, brother. You made a smart move, but you have to keep yourself. Defend it while doing it. Rickon nodded, still a scowl on his face from being beaten. John crouched down when you can defend yourself properly with a shield. I'll be able to teach you how to batter someone with it at the same time. You did good though today, you might get me one day. Rickon started to smile. I will one day. Sooner than you think. John raised his eyebrows that picked him up before Rickon could respond, putting him on his shoulders. He could hear him start to laugh. Now then, let's go eat before the day begins. Rickon gave a groan between laughs as they made their way inward. His younger brother's life had become a lot busier since his return. Their lessons before dawn were simply a good way of calming him for the day to come. He's missed too much from this war, I'll give as much back as I can John had resolved upon their reunion. Rickon was to sit in with any petitioners that John had. To train with the master of arms and the other children around the castle. And to sit in his lessons. The lessons had been the hardest until John had decided to have old man lead them with help from the princess Shireen. How old man lied still I will never know. Though John was glad of it, her presence and the princess had seemed to calm his brother. And Sam returning will no doubt be a boon. John smiled at the thought of his friend a raven had come stating that he had found what was needed. He knew John was at Winterfell, and that he would be recalled to Winterfell. The Bolton's maester has been sent to the wall, I'll have another friend at my side instead. John grinned at. The thought of that, as the two Starks made their way into the Great Hall. Rickon had climbed off, running towards Osha, Old Man, and Val at the head table. More would be coming soon, and with it the day would begin. And today I can finally speak with Howland Reed. John had been busy ever since his crowning to have a proper conversation with the man. There was too much to be done to sit idly and talk about a woman he'd never met. There was too much to be dealt with from preparing for winter, making plans for the war to come and spending time with Val and Rickon. Winter fell, and the king in the north could not be still. But with Lord Robic Glover and Alsoon had returned recently with Robit's son Gwen and newborn daughter Irina preparations for obtaining Dragon Glass on Skagos underway, and the deal with the Iron Bank made to last throughout winter John had time. John sat in his solar as he waited for Lord Reed to arrive. The thought of gaining more knowledge on his mother was something John had wanted for a long time before his death. His birth father giving him a name had been more than he had come to terms with when he was at the wall. A name alone had given John a sense of peace. Whatever the tale was at this point, John was simply glad to know it. 
an end to a story that had hovered over him since birth. Lord Reed entered the solar quietly, taking his seat opposite John. John poured him a drink for him. The man was short like his people but had brought great things in John's eyes since his arrival at Winterfell. The Lord of the Neck had brought Rob's will, a last gift from his brother. Who'd always seen me as a brother. He had also brought Hollis Mollen, the guard that had been protecting his father's bones. John had almost hugged both of them for that. John had appointed Mollen captain of the guard for guarding and returning Ned Stark's bones. For all that I am Brandon's son I will always be Ned's too. Even if I don't follow his path now. Lord Reed looked at him with pensive green eyes as he took a sip. The eyes had a sense of otherness to him. My king, he said humbly. John shook his head, John is fine Lord Reed. Lord Reed gave a small smile, then call me Howland. Brandon was like that when I met him, never one for formal titles. I see that wildness is in you. Though when Ned wrote of you, he always said you were like him. John smiled back, I will you've seen the scars like everyone else. Death doesn't leave us unscathed. Howland's face turned solemn, a fair point. And this war has done much to change us all. And the war with the dead I imagine will do the same to us. John nodded to him. I though it won't change that we are Northmen. Howland sipped from his cup and the two took a moment of comfortable silence. It wasn't Ned who told you about Brandon being your father was it? Howland asked. He figured that out quick. No, I met Brandon in the crypts. He was the one to tell me. He was also the one to tell me to ask you about Ashara. Our time was too short. Howland took another sip, keeping his solemn face, what I know from the tourney was Brandon and the sheriff's relationship was nothing more than a dalliance. They were both willful people, charmers and ones who preferred to enjoy life over duties. The two gravitated in that time. John listened as he drank slowly. The news hadn't surprised him, he had known Brandon's reputation for a long time. That didn't bother him in the slightest. I didn't see your mother again until after the war had ended. Not until after seeing the horrors that Raver had done to Lyanna in Dorne. We had only come to Starfall out of duty to return Dawn to House Dane and hopefully gain a ship to bring Lyanna's bones home. That was where we had found you with your... mother. John looked at the man intently. He could see the sadness in Howland's eyes. She was different when we met you. The Ashera we had met at the tourney was beautiful, vibrant, and alive. The woman we met at Starfall looked almost a ghost. Ashera had been traumatized by the losses. She told us she had been forced to see Brandon and Ricard die, and the news of Elia, and her children had broken her. I didn't expect this to be a happy tale. John said grimly. Helen sighed then took a long drink. Your mother was not in a fit state. We had heard her ramble about whispers telling her of Elia and her children. That had been when she said for Ned take you north Ned had already spoken of doing that to have another of his blood with him, and to keep you safe. He didn't trust her with you. Ashera offering only made it all the simpler to take you to Winterfell, even if it came with a price of claiming you as his to his wife. Howlett paused and smiled slightly, though I doubt the man ever regretted taking you as his son. John gave a small smile of his own before taking a large drink. And what happened to my mother? She left on another ship, heading east neither of us understood why. She only said that it was to find justice. I know she didn't kill herself as the stories tell. Even as she was, there was a sense of purpose to her when she had said that. Do you know where she went? John asked quietly, almost like a boy. Helen shook his head, I don't I'm afraid. Only that she went east. I believe that was why Ned never mentioned her sooner. He didn't want to speak without knowing where she was first. The two returned to silence for a long while drinking as John mused on his mother. Maybe I'll know you in another life. But my duties come first. John spoke calmly after finishing his drink. Thank you Howland. Thank you for telling me. You had a right to know by now. Howland simply stated. John poured another drink for the two. There's another matter I would like to talk with you too. Something in regards to South. Of course, what can I do to help? Howland offered as he took a more measured drink. John smiled. You've heard that me and Lord Manderley have finished bargaining with the Iron Bank. Howland nodded by. The first shipments will come in a moon's turn. 
How much did they damage us to help keep our bellies full for the long night? John grimaced. The terms were not bad considering it will give us more to fill our stores permanently. It will still take every piece of gold and silver from the north. That wasn't an exaggeration. John and Lord Manderley's dealings with Tycho Nestoris to expand the deal John had done at the wall was expensive. Every piece of coinage in the coffers of the North would have to be given. John was happy to get rid of all the North's gold and sliver coins to keep all his people alive and fed during the long night. The Northmen were after seeing the dead men. John had happy to have Manderley's presence to help with the negotiation. His knowledge on trade and the East was invaluable and the 23 warships he had built for Rob, increasing the Western Navy to 60 ships, would be essential for helping ferry the supplies to the North Manderley had also been right to suggest they pay it in installments as opposed to a loan. It is better to pay the bank than takes loans, they'll loan us forever if we take one out. You can't eat gold and silver. Helen stated. No, we can't, but it is useful, something that the Lannisters always claim to know. John started to grin as Howland gave him a curious look. What would you have me do? John's grin turned savage. The people of the Neck are the best scouts in the North, and the most legal scouts in the realm. Find a way into the Rock. I'll send Mage and some forces with you. We'll take every last bit of gold in that castle. It can help rebuild the North and keep us warm. Howland looked at him and smiled. I swear that we'll take it by earth and water by bronze and iron, by ice and fire. John offered his hand, and they shook firmly. You Lannisters will suffer. The two were interrupted by a knock on the door. One of the castle guards entered. My king, there are two ravens for you from Moat Kaelin. The guard passed the missives to him. One line stood out above the rest. My needle has served me well. Thank you for teaching me to stick them with a pointy end. Arya, you're home. Chapter and Notes. Hope you all enjoy. Wanted to set up the conflict between the North and Vilish there. As you can see, the Vale and River Lords don't get past the neck in this that's as far in the North as they go. Also wanted the Northmen to be pissed at the Vale for not fighting first time around. Felt that they rightfully should be, even though they are unaware as to why exactly. They the Northern perspective, they betrayed Ned by not fighting Tay free and avenge him. The next couple of chapters will move south before returning to Moat Kaelin because the conflict in the south is ongoing. If anyone has questions please ask. The Remnants of Valyria. Chapter Notes. Hope you all enjoy, feel free to comment as always. See the end of the chapter for more notes Daenerys. The war had truly begun now for Daenerys. With alliances made and the issue of her nephew dealt with through a marriage once they met at King's Landing, the conquest could begin. Her armies of Dabraki unsullied, freedmen Tyrells and Ironborn would go unopposed. Half of her unsullied and all her freedmen had been sent west by ship to take control of the West Tyrion had promised an easy way into the rock only known by him. Her Dabraki led by Jorah had been sailed over onto the southern Riverlands, where their forces would push westward, blocking the Westerlands from moving their armies and the Riverlands to boot. Daenerys felt particular comfortable with that knowledge. The Dabraki were unmatched. And while they prevented her from being attacked from behind, she would be taking the city with her nephew. Ser Baristan and the Sand Snakes had been sent ahead to confirm the alliance. Maybe he'll be late. I'll take it before he arrives, have him kneel by my feet. Daenerys smiled at the god as she sailed through the night. Her dragons above her alongside the Ironborn and the Tyrell forces that had accompanied Olenek. Her second son Garland would be leading the Tyrell forces that had remained at High Garden and the other half of the Reach was likely to follow now that an alliance had been made. Half of the Reach army had already declared for Aegon directly so would be joining them at King's Landing. I can remind them of their oaths. You're looking forward to this aren't you my queen? Olena asked Riley. Daenerys looked at the old woman, I am. It is my birthright. I look forward to taking back what is mine. Olena snorted, the true dragon then. I wonder if your nephew has that same fire. Daenerys frowned. My brother called himself a dragon. He was just a snake. I most likely expect my nephew to be the same. Olena raised her eyebrow at her. How do you intend to prove that? Daenerys looked upwards. I'll let my dragons decide whether he is my blood. Olena looked upwards like her queen. 
only queen. I'm sure they'll know who the true dragon is. Olena said shortly. Daenerys looked at the old woman. You may leave now. Olena bowed shortly then walked off. She was glad to be alone, only her dragon's roars in the night giving her comfort. My children long for home life. Me. To give fire and blood to those that wronged us and our family. The peace of the night ended with a violent crash as one of her ships rammed into her own. Daenerys could barely keep herself stood from the crash, holding to the rails. It was followed by another, a ship to her right had as well. Then the scream started. Her ship wasn't the only one being cracked.